Hi, I'm Margie with Flow Motion Education, and in this video, I'm going to explain foot pronation and supination. This video is a long time in the making. I've been meaning to make it for years. And the main reason I deem to make it is that pretty much everybody needs healthy pronation and supination. And I have yet to have a single person walk through my treatment door who can actually do both on both feet. And I'm currently taking an informal survey with my colleagues and they're all saying the same thing. They've never yet had anybody walk into the door of their treatment room who can both pronate and supinate and everybody needs both. So I end up starting there with just about all of my clients and I end up by starting with explaining what foot pronation and supination mean. And I'm getting kind of bored of explaining it to everybody. So I'm making this video and it's going to be prerequisite viewing for anybody who works with me privately or takes any of my workshops. So the definitions, you would think that there are good, strong, rigorous definitions of foot pronation and supination because the words are used pretty widely. But it turns out it's a little fuzzy. Even within the world of podiatry, you might see slightly different definitions. So basically, foot pronation and supination, the words pronation and supination, describe both a foot shape and a foot function. Today we're going to start with the function and then we'll go to the shape. And you can't talk about the function of the foot without talking about gait, G-A-I-T, gait, or walking. I think everybody would agree that is the primary function of the foot. So before I dive in and talk about the function of the foot, I'm going to talk just a little bit about walking. When we talk about gait in order to discuss it, we describe what happens in a single footstep. And we divide that footstep into what we call phases. Now, this might sound really technical, but since you probably walk, once I just start describing a single footstep broken into phases, you'll go, oh yeah, that's what I do every time I take a step. So we typically start with, and I need to qualify this, my left leg is gonna be my reference leg, and for right now, you're going to ignore my right leg. We typically, when we describe a single footstep, would use heel strike, as the first phase. So the leg has just swung, and then you heel strike. Uh, let me also qualify that we're going to be mainly talking about the load-bearing phases of gait, because when the leg is swinging, the foot's just not as interesting as when it is bearing the weight of your body. So I'm gonna start over. The foot has just swung. I'm not interested in swing right now. Heel strike. First phase. Second phase, some textbooks call it loading. We're going to call it suspension phase. Hint, hint, suspension. Think of the suspension in your car, shock absorption. You're still looking at the left, forget the right. There's then single leg stance, and that is when the opposite leg is swinging, but the reference leg is still my left. And then heel lift, and then propulsion or propelling my mass forward and swing and we start over. I'm going to do it one more time. Heel strike, suspension, single leg stance, ignore the right leg, still looking at the left, heel lift and propulsion over and over. That's what happens in a single footstep. I'm going to simplify it even more. So basically, we want to think about the foot the function of the foot during gait, it's either receiving the mass of your body, this time you get to look at the right leg, or it's pushing your mass forward. It's doing one or the other. It's either receiving your mass. This is specifically the load-bearing phases. We're not talking about swing. Foot's not as interesting in swing phase. More interesting when it's in contact with the ground and bearing the weight of your body. So you're either receiving your mass or you're pushing your mass off the foot 
and moving it forward. That simple. Turns out that the function of pronation is to receive your mass, and a pronating foot is considered, it's a shock absorbing foot, and it's considered a mobile adapter. So the foot is unlocked. We did not evolve to walk on flat, hard surfaces. We evolved to walk on uneven terrain. So in this position is where your foot, when it's receiving your mass, that it shock absorbs and it adapts to uneven terrain. And this time you get to look at my right foot. It turns out that when your foot is moving your mass off of it or moving your mass forward is a supinating foot and the foot becomes a rigid lever. A supinated foot is a rigid lever. So I'm just gonna repeat this. In gait, you're either receiving the mass of your body or you're pushing your mass forward. One of two things. The foot receiving the mass of your body is a pronating foot. The foot moving your mass forward or off of it is a supinating foot. Supinating foot, rigid lever, because would you want to propel the whole mass of your body forward with a floppy mobile adapter or a rigid lever? If you said rigid lever, you're right. So supinating foot is a rigid lever to propel you forward. Pronating foot to receive your mass is a shock absorbing foot that's also a mobile adapter. That's the function. Now we get to talk about the shape of the foot. So here's a foot, 26 bones, 33 joints. A quarter of all the joints in your body are in your feet. Do you think your foot was meant to move? So I'm gonna introduce you to a very important bone, the talus bone right there. It is the connection between the foot and the upper body. So it sits between the heel bone, here's the talus bone, heel bone, and the tibia, which is not part of the foot complex. So it's the connection between the foot and the upper body. Uh, my teacher, Gary Ward, with whom I've been studying since 2014, author of WTF, What the Foot, calls the talus the driver of the bus. So I like to think of the talus as having sort of like a lighthouse light. It can rotate in toward the midline of the body, that's this side, the big toe side, or it can rotate away from the midline of the body. And that looks like it can rotate in toward the midline of the body, and it can rotate away from the midline of the body. In pronation. So let me take a step back. So if I were to rigorously define pronation and supination, 33 joints, I would have to define what every single joint, all 33, are doing in all three planes of motion, because, or three dimensions, because we live in a three-dimensional world. So your joints, most of them, move in three dimensions. I'm going to spare you, and I'm going to just describe the shape or the movements that you can see if you're learning how to do them and you check in a mirror, you're watching yourself in a mirror. So I'm describing shapes that you can see or perhaps you can feel. And I'm gonna keep it really simple. I'm not gonna describe all 33 joints in three planes of motion. So we've already talked about what the talus can do. In pronation, the talus rotates in toward the midline of the body in toward the mid, remember that lighthouse light. In pronation, the arch lowers and the foot lengthens. Because the arch is lowering, the foot gets longer. So if I measure from here to here and I lower the arch, can you see how that distance increases? So the foot gets longer and it gets wider. Now, just interesting, little geeky here, but interesting. 
that watch what happens. I'm going to maintain the tripod that hopefully you've watched the tripod video before you watch this one. If not, go back and watch it. The importance of the tripod of where your weight bearing in your feet or your contact points in your feet. But I'm going to hold the tripod down because if you've watched the tripod video, you know that uh, healthy foot mechanics depend on having an optimal tripod. So I'm holding down the big toe ball and the little toe ball and watch what happens when I rotate the talus in toward the midline of the body. Do you see how it's coupled with the arch lowering? And I'm gonna be clear, uh, there is no vector in this hand that's pushing down. All I'm doing is rotating and just by rotating, the arch lowers, because the arch lowers, the foot lengthens and widens. Um, and then the final piece of pronation is the heel bone does what we call eversion. And I'm gonna do a big exaggeration, but you sort of tip to the inside of the heel. Huge exaggeration, so just let me reiterate very quickly in pronation, because these are things in my exercises that you are going to be checking yourself for. In pronation, the talus rotates in toward the midline of the body. In pronation, the arch lowers, the foot lengthens and spreads. And in pronation, the heel everts, or the weight shifts from the center to the inside of the bone. I have good news for you. Supination is just the opposite. So we can go a lot faster. The talus bone externally rotates or rotates away from the midline of the body. Watch what happens when I rotate. So I'm maintaining these two points of contact here. And when I rotate the talus away, I'm not pulling up. Notice how the arch lifts because the arch lifts the point, this distance from here to here, shortened, so the foot gets shorter and narrower, and the weight in the heel, I'm doing a big exaggeration, moves from the center to the outside of the bone. Um, I would just want to point out one more thing for when you're doing your homework. You may have noticed that to get the tibia uh, talus to rotate, I'm actually not touching the talus. I'm, I'm on the tibia. And um, it would be really hard for you to find your talus. I take workshops with physical therapists, chiropractors, etc., but you know, all kinds of professions. And we all go, where's the talus? Where's the talus? But it turns out conveniently for these exercises that the tibia, shin bone, which is very easy to find and grab onto, and the talus bone in the rotational plane are married. Where one goes, the other goes. So we are going to be using in your exercises, you're going to grab onto your tibia with the intention of rotating the talus, or you may drive rotation down to your tibia with the intention of rotating the talus. And I'm just going to close with pronation gets a bad rap, but we need to pronate. We need shock absorption, and maybe we need the mobile adapter if you happen to hike on uneven terrain, but we definitely need shock absorption. And where pronation gets a bad rap is some people get stuck in pronation. So pronation's not good if you're stuck in pronation and you can't get out of it, nor is supination. You really need to be able to move pronation, supination, pronation, supination, and receive your mouse, move your mouse forward, receive your mouse, move your mouse forward. Um, and I'm going to quote my uh, dear, co brilliant colleague, Monica Volkmar. Check her out, Monica Volkmar. Um, she says, pronation is like going to Walmart. You get in, you get what you need, and you get out as fast as possible. And I'm going to leave you with that. <laughs>